All right, how's it going, y'all? So today is going to be kind of a follow-on video to my 15 reasons why your Synology is slow. So if you wanna check that out, it's a longer form video than this one's gonna be, but it's gonna be kind of going over that in theory more. And today we're gonna to be going over exactly the settings that are most optimal to get the maximum speed out of your Synology NAS. So just a quick disclaimer on this is all of these are going to assume that you are not network limited. That means that you are not saturating your either one gig connection or your 10 gig connection. And probably that means you're not on Wi-Fi because in almost all circumstances, Wi-Fi will always be slower than what a Synology can handle. And we're also going to assume that you're locally connected using SMB connection. This is where most people are using the full speed of their NAS and where you can actually start running into performance issues. And so this video is just going to be really going over all of the specific DSM settings that you should check to make sure you can get the maximum speed out of your Synology NAS. And we're just gonna go ahead and go over control panel. So the very first one that's going to get you by far your most bang for your buck is going to be under the SMB settings. And it's going to be going into advanced settings and making sure that your minimum SMB protocol is at least SMB2. SMB2 is going to be a significant upgrade from SMB1 for most users, and so that is very important to have. And SMB1 is also just not secure, so these are what I would recommend. However, most clients will be automatically negotiating to SMB3, most modern clients, so it's not too big of a deal. Then we go into transport encryption mode and server signing should both be disabled if you want maximum performance. So these do have a small level of security associated with them. So transport encryption mode encrypts the connection as it's going over the network. And so what this means is if somebody was to break into your network and compromise a switch or something, and then use that for packet capturing, if it's an encrypted connection, they would not be able to get anything other than jumbled nothing. However, this has an insane, insane speed slowdown, especially over a 10 gig connection because every single thing has to be encrypted. And SMB honestly does not encrypt with necessarily the fastest algorithms. And so it's not like an HTTPS connection that's also encrypted. I found SMB to be very slow when you do have it forced or on. So I would recommend for highest performance do disabled, and that will give you a huge step up in performance. Now, the one exception to this is if you are running your Synology as a Windows, Windows Active Directory domain, then you have to have this as on because they're sending passwords back and forth and therefore you must have it. So that would be the one exception. Then the next one that is going to get you less but still a fair amount is going to be server signing. Server signing is essentially every single time a new connection's created, it goes through and has a unique signature that goes through and says, hey, Yes, I am actually the server you're talking to. And the reason you do that is that way somebody cannot impersonate your server on a separate network and then go through and use that to grab credentials. This is a bit more of a security possibility than somebody actually breaking into your network because if somebody's broken into your network and is packet capturing, you probably have bigger issues on your hand. And it's very important not to have SMB over the internet anyway, so that's really the only chance you've got. But SMB server signing, is important in the case where you were to go through and say, say you had a coffee shop and for whatever reason you decided to try to connect to your server even though it was not going to be accessible. If somebody knew what your server's IP address was and the host name and everything and knew enough about it to actually go through and emulate it to your computer, they could steal your credentials. I think they should be hashed, don't quote me on that. They should be hashed, but they would be able to be used to then break into your server at your home if they had access to that. Once again, that is pretty unlikely to happen. They would have to know a lot about you and it would have to be a very targeted attack. And so I'd say there's probably a lot of other things that they could go through and attack before that being the easiest one, but that is what it would protect you from. If you want, go through, check it out, turn and leave this as enabled or forced, depending on what you wanna do. Forced might not allow some clients to connect but go through and try those out and see how much of a performance hit you get. Because if you don't get a large performance hit from server signing and you're okay with that, it's worth it to leave on just as a just in case. Then opportunistic locking is going to be crucial for most things 
other than very, very, very small, small files. So opportunistic locking allows the client to go through and, and kind of keep a stream open, basically a, a file connection open, even if it's not really being used. And so it is a huge performance benefit for almost all workflows, unless you have absolutely tiny, tiny, tiny workflows. And that would be if you were kind of storing like a database or something similar to that, actually on the Synology and accessing it over SMB. That is not a good idea to do it in the first place. And just SMB in general has very poor small file performance anyway. But in the case where something's being open, closed, open, closed, open, closed a lot, that's where disabling opportunistic locking would be good. But you do not have that use case almost certainly. And so make sure to enable opportunistic locking. Then if you're not using AFP, I would highly recommend adding in the SMB durable handles, just because the longer you can have a single handle open, basically a connection open, the faster it will be overall, because then files will not have to go through and reopen connections all the time. Instead, it can just use an already open connection, which speeds things up. The Mac OS ones, nothing really too big here. The one thing is you can either have cross protocol locking with AFP. I would recommend getting off AFP anyway, if you are using Mac OS in pretty much all cases. There's one or two cases I've run into where AFP is still worth it. But other than that, get off AFP and get to SMB. And so now to Others. Others actually has a couple of things ca that can be pretty decently useful, such as Deer Sort. So directory sort goes through and sorts the directories before being sent to the client. That can be very useful because it's a lot faster to do on this end than the other end. But if you don't need that, it will take a lot of latency every single time you open a new folder. So that will slow down. Then going through, and the biggest one that will have some performance implications here is going through and enable asynchronous read. That will go through and actually speed things up a lot for clients who wanna have multiple SMB connections, basically accessing multiple things asynchronously. If you have a lot of people connecting at the same time and you do not have an SMB cache, then asynchronous read could overload the file server in cases, and instead you would wanna disable that. But unless you get very large, and I'm talking a ton of sequential performance, then you are going to want to enable asynchronous read as possible. Another thing is if you are often opening, closing tiny, tiny, tiny files and writing a lot of small files, click do not reserve disk space when creating files. That's because every single time it's got a reserve disk space, that is an operation that has to be locked down and go to the entire file protocol, which takes a lot longer than going through and just saying, oh, file there. Then finally, if you are going through and you are using search, enabling the wildcard search is a pretty useful thing to have if you're going to be doing that a lot. That will go through and just cache specific searches that you use all the time. If your company is doing that, it can be very useful, but if they're not, it's not gonna get you anything. And so those are, the SMB specific settings. And then on to actually one more that I nearly forgot is the transfer log. Transfer log, if you're going through and doing a lot of small, small file transfers, you wanna disable this unless it's really useful. If you do enable it, go through and make sure to just enable the specific things that you care about. Because if you're doing something like a read, that will have so many logs and every single time anything happens has gotta log it. And so that could be thousands of logs for just opening a few files and just going through and like, oh, I'm gonna copy all these files over and now boom, that's a single log for every single one of those objects. So I would only enable that if you need it and then only enable the specific things you need. Then one of the things that I do not know why it's not enabled, but has massive, massive, massive performance implications is the file fast clone. This is only applicable to BTRFS volumes but what this does, and it's one of the coolest BTRFS features is, say you go through and you copy a file from one part of the SMB server to another part. It's gotta be the same shared folder, by the way. If you go through and do that, and you've got this enabled, it will copy instantly. As in, you can copy a two terabyte folder from one place to another place, and it will go through instantaneously copy. Even better, until there's changes on that second folder, it will not take up any space. And that is one of BTRFS's coolest features. ZFS is very similar and could do this, except they've never made the Samba modules that are required to do this. But the reason it's able to do this is because BTRFS is a copy on write file system, which means that all files are really just stored as changes to other files. 
and it gives you a lot of great performance implications for certain workflows. And it also gives you the cool things like snapshots, but it also gives you this because it knows at the time that those two were copied that they were identical. And so then instead of having to recreate all that data on disk, it just has to make new headers for all those files to say, okay, this file is composed of this data in this disk location. And so that way you can have multiple files all referencing the same data on disk, which makes it not only way more storage efficient. So like if you've got a company that everybody always likes to go through and copy files to their own user folders, you could have deduplication without ever actually having to deduplicate anything because it's all originating from the same place. And so this is a huge thing to actually enable and I do not know why it's not enabled by default. And so those are the big settings with an SMB in the file server. Now onto the, your network. And for a network, the important thing is gonna be jumbo frames. So jumbo frames are something that can be very, very, very useful for some people and absolutely decimate performance for other people. You need to make sure if you're gonna enable jumbo frames that every single device in between your NAS and your computer supports jumbo frames. And if possible, put it on a separate VLAN. It can also have some poor performance for gamers. So if you are gaming a lot and that's your primary focus and it's just a nice to have having a little bit more speed out of your NAS, then it's worth it to go through and check out and see if you can tell a difference between the two. And if you do have a faster NAS with a faster CPU, jumbo frames are less likely to help you. It tends to be for computers or Synologies that have slower CPUs that just cannot handle having thousands of network packets. Instead, jumbo frames just glump them all into big one. So to do that, you would go into network interface, select your card, and then go through and set your MTU manually to 9,000 most likely. 9,000 is jumbo frames. But make sure, I've got a video on jumbo frames. I'll go ahead and leave in the description below. Check that out. Make sure everything's gonna support it. And first, make sure it's required. If you have a faster NAS, there's a decent chance it's actually not even worth it to go through and set up jumbo frames, especially with all the weird things that can happen. But those are gonna be by far the most important things that I see quite often whenever people are going through and saying, hey, I need help, my Synology's being slow. When they're on a local connection, those are by far gonna be the biggest things. For physical upgrades, you can also always add in more RAM, and in some cases, a NVMe SSD cache. And then finally, look into things like Drive, but those are all gonna be covered in that more in-depth video. These were just those really low hanging fruit that go through and get you 90% of the way the majority of times. All right, well, that's gonna be it for this tutorial. Go and leave any other tutorials like see me make in the comments below, and have a good one. Bye.